So the year was 2011, and my wife bought me tickets to see my favorite Texas singer-songwriter, Lyle Lovett and his large band. So we get to the concert, and, and, and we sit down, and, and Lyle starts to warm up with the band, and my wife looks at me, and she says, babe, I'm not feeling well. And I said, well, well babe, it's okay. You, you go to the restroom. Lyle and I, we got it. So she goes to the restroom, and about five minutes later, she sends a text, and she's like, babe, I'm, I'm really not feeling well. And I said, I said, babe, don't worry. Lyle's on his third song. We're good in here. You do that in there, and then so we'll connect. It's good. And about five minutes later, I get another text, and she says, no, seriously, I don't feel well. We need to go home. So I told Lyle I got to leave. The next day, I'm sitting in my office, and, and she shoots me another text, and it just simply says, babe, I'm pregnant. I said, how did that happen? <laughs> now, I'm kind of a man's man. I lead a men's organization. So, so I started putting on that I couldn't wait to have a son. I couldn't wait to have a son to, to, to carry on my name, the lineage. We go and we hear the heartbeat, and the heartbeat is strong. And I'm, and I'm texting my guys and saying, my son's just down there working out in my wife's womb, just getting ready. But deep, deep in the recesses of my heart, I wanted a little girl so bad. So we get to that, that appointment where you, you learn the sex of the child. You get into the doctor's office, and she's got that Harry Potter wand, and you can see the baby on the screen. It's a true story. The baby's flipping around, flipping around, and I jump out of my seat, and I said, Doc, there it is. It's a boy. Doctor looks at me and says, Mr. Harper, sit down. That's its arm. <laughs> so I sit down. I flipped it over again, and she said, actually, it's a little girl. Oh, I was overcome with gratitude and thanksgiving. What's interesting, sitting there and looking at that screen, I could not tell the difference between a boy and a girl. Brothers and sisters, do you know we're living in a day that doesn't want you to know the difference between a boy and a girl? that says there's no difference between a man and a woman. As a matter of fact, they've taken a step further and said that a man really is useless. The leading feminist thought today says the world needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And what has happened, as Brother Walker alluded to, is it's created confusion. Confusion amongst are men. Two generations ago, men were confident in their call to manhood and masculinity. A generation ago, we began to compromise that call, and today we are confused about that call. To say it another way, in the 1970s, it was, I don't need a man. In the 1990s, it became, I don't want a man. And in 2023, it's, what is a man? That's where we've come in 50 or 60 years utter confusion and what happens when men are confused what happens when men don't have a path one of two things one they will they will resign they will slow quit their masculinity they will never step into the full inheritance god has for them they can't find a way, so they just fade into the background. You, you can see these men all over. Typically, they're about five to six feet behind their wives with their head down. They don't speak or think for themselves. They just exist. The other option is they forge their own path. They step into this world of toxic masculinity, the David Goggins and the Andrew Tates of this world that are so popular. The Invictus men, the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. Whatever's in my way, I will destroy to become whatever it is I want to become. And it will manifest itself in unhealthy sexual relationships and drive for success and applause. 
And when you think about that, men are following into the, into the, the two lies that have been told since the beginning of time. Satan is not creative. The Bible says he's crafty. There's a difference. He's been telling men the same two lies since the beginning of time. The first lie was eat this fruit, and in the Hebrew it says you shall be as Elohim. You'll be God. Eat this fruit, you won't need God. That's the first lie. You're so good, you don't need God. Well, they eat the fruit, and what happens? In their guilt, in their shame, in their nakedness, they go and hide. That's the second lie. You're so bad, God can never love you. Every man in this room, every man you set out to disciple will live his life between those two lies. And this is how crafty Satan is. Chris Harper can wake up in the morning and I can be believing the first lie, I'm so good, I don't really need God. And by lunchtime, I'm believing the second. I'm so bad, God could never really love me. So what we have to do as we disciple men is we have, to, we have to navigate these two lies. We have to set them on a path, a biblical path, a theological path, a practical path that leads to life. We need to hold a generation of men together on an intentional journey in and through manhood. We've got to show them the way. If Robert Lewis and R.T. Phillips and Pat Morley and these legends of the men's movement in the 90s and early 2000s, if they were here, they would tell you that the enemy was passivity, that we had men who knew how to be men but, but would not be men, so we had to call them out. Well, I'm telling you today, the enemy is not passivity. The enemy is ignorance. We have a whole generation of men who did not have spiritual fathers. Most of them did not have physical fathers. So we have transcended from passivity and we have stepped into ignorance. They do not know how to be men. So instead of calling them out, we must call them up to something. If you lead a men's ministry today, if you pastor a church, we are not going to guilt and shame men back to the church. And we've already won the women. So stop with the dad jokes. Stop with the guilt-ridden Father's Day sermons. Stop calling men out unless you're willing to call them up to something better, something greater. We've got to put them on a path and disciple them in and towards King Jesus. We don't have to reinvent manhood. We just have to reclaim it. God's given us the picture of the perfect man in his son, King Jesus. So we put men on a journey. It's an old journey it's an ancient journey, and it is one rooted in Scripture. It's a path. What does that path look like? First, first, it's an invitation to the journey from an older, established man or community of men. That's the first step. There is this massive shift in the church in the 80s and 90s where we moved away from multi-generational churches to life-on-life to -life peer groups. Somehow we thought putting a bunch of 20-year-olds together would uh, encourage wisdom. It's not iron sharpening iron. It's like two butter knives rubbing together. No, there has to be a call. There has to be an invitation from an older man or an older community of, of men. 
I remember um, being saved. I, I was saved, and I didn't know what to do as a Christian. I was 26 years old, so the next day I go to a service event at my church. I walk through the door, and a 70-year-old retired plumber with a sixth-grade education looks at me and says, Son, you have the countenance of the Lord on you. I said, Bro, I have no idea what that means. He said, Do you know what God wants from you? I said, No, sir. He said, he desires obedience before sacrifice. Do you know where that's at? I said, no, sir. That old man set me down at his kitchen table for a year every Wednesday night, and he walked me through the word of God. Eight months into that relationship, he said, I'm turning 71. I'm having a pool party. I want you to come. I said, I'm not coming to your pool party. He said, no, I really want you there. I said, really, I'm not coming, and it's kind of creepy that you're pushing this hard. The night before the pool party, his wife calls me, Miss Georgetta, and she says, Mr. Don really wants you at the pool party. When Miss Georgetta asks, you don't say no. So I showed up to the pool party the next night where he introduced me to his granddaughter, whom I married eight months later. Sometimes you find a mentor and a wife. But it's an invitation from an older man or an older community of men to come on the path. Some of you older men in this room, some of you, some, some of the older men in your church, you feel like you've got nothing left to offer. You feel like you've been sidelined. Well, let me tell you, there's a younger man waiting for your wisdom, waiting for your experience. And maybe all you have to offer is I've failed many, many times. I just want to help you fail one time less. I am standing here today, and I'm standing on the shoulders of a 70-year-old retired plumber with a sixth-grade education. It's an invitation from an older, established man or community of men. Then there is a pathway, a clear and concise definition of what it means to be God's man. Listen to me. You cannot become what you cannot define. So it is offering a definition of what it means to be God's man. And then, then it is moving towards the death of childhood thinking and relating. We disciple men into putting to death thinking like a child. The apostle Paul says, when I became a man, I put childish things away. If you've never seen the YouTube video, The Parisian Spider-Man, you should go watch it. The Parisian Spider-Man. It's got over 50 million views. It happened four or five years ago. A 26-year-old man was walking through the streets of Paris. He was on his way to a football game. And he looks to his left and he notices a three-year-old boy hanging from the fourth floor of a building hanging off the balcony. And in a moment of courage, he scales this building like Spider-Man. It's unbelievable. He scales the building like Spider-Man, and just as the boy lets go, he snatches the boy out of midair and sets him on the balcony. Became world famous. Most people don't know the other half of that story. The three-year-old's dad was sitting inside the apartment playing Super Smash Bros. on Xbox. It is a call to put away childish things and act like men. So you invite them on the journey. You set the pathway in a clear, concise direction. You tell them to put to death childhood thinking and then becomes a season of transformation and training in an encouraging space. Room to fail. Room to succeed, but we have to train them. We have to walk alongside them, guide them. My house backs up to a park, and my neighbor, my neighbor brought a drone over to my house, and we flew it in the park. He flew it in the park, and my kids loved it. So I thought to myself, I'm going to go get a drone. So I did. I went and bought a drone, not like a small drone, but not like a CIA drone, like a middle drone. Got GPS, take pictures, 
camera. I brought the drone home, and I told my kids, I'm going to charge this drone. I'm going to go to work, and when I come home tonight, it's drone night. It's drone day. It's a holiday at my house. So I get home that night, and I come to the door, and my kids are chanting, drone day, drone day. I take the drone off the charger, and as I'm walking out the back door, my wife, in her infinite wisdom, says, um, Chris, are you not going to read the instructions? And this is how unintelligent I am. I want, you to, I want you to think about what I put together. These are the words I actually said. I said, babe, I drive a pickup truck. I can fly a drone. As if somehow those things relate. So I get to, the, to, to, to this park. It's a community park, a public park. And I fire up the drone. It's about eight feet. And then it takes off, and it is wheels off. There's a man with his family coming around a walking path, pushing a stroller. I clip him. He dives into the bushes. (laughs) Scares me to death. My two-year-old is with me. I start running after the drone and smoke my two-year-old. As if somehow the closer I get to the drone, I can control it. (laughs) Then it hits a house, and then I lose it somewhere off of I-20. My eight-year-old walks up to me and he says, "Uh, Dad, was that expensive? I said, yeah, yeah, it was. He said, will they send us another one? Get in the truck, son. We got to go look for this drone. I should have read the manual. I should have watched the videos. I should have went over to my neighbor and said, hey, teach me how to do this. We have to be active in training men. The best way you can do that is is like the Apostle Paul say, watch my life, imitate my life as I imitate the life of King Jesus. So we invite them into a season of transformation. And And then lastly, my favorite, it's a recognition and it's a blessing by a community of men that lets them go out and take their rightful place in the world. So we say, hey, come come and follow me. Here's the pathway. We're going to put to death childhood thinking. We're going to experience a season of transformation. And then we're going to have a commissioning to send you out, not to be a drain on the world, but to bless the world just like King Jesus. That's what we're going to do. We're going to help you be the wall that God has called you to be. That's what we need. I was telling the men last night, I'm a big history buff. So when Xerxes, ruler of Persia, when he would go into the Grecian states, he would send out a messenger and he would say, Xerxes is coming. If you go ahead and just lay down and submit, we won't rape, we won't pillage. We'll just conquer you and everything will be good. So they would go to each Grecian city state and do that. Well, then one day the messenger comes to Sparta and he calls for the king of Sparta and he says, hey, listen, Xerxes and the mighty mighty army of Persia is coming. If you just lay down, we won't rape and pillage everything. Just assimilate and all will be good. And the Persian messenger said, and you probably want to listen because, because Sparta doesn't even have a wall around its city like you're defenseless. And the Spartan king kind of makes this noise. He says, hoorah. And about 20,000 Spartan men, shoulder to shoulder, shield to shield, form a circle around the city. And he looks at the Persian messenger and he says, we are the wall. We are the wall. Brothers and sisters, we are training up men to be the wall. The wall around their family the wall around their homes, the wall around their church, the wall around their cities. They are the wall. Today, we start rebuilding walls. 